So I'm Emily Costello. I am a recent postdoc at the University of Hawaii. Finished my dissertation defense in March just before shutdown. And uh, I've lovingly termed this project a quarantine project. I finished my defense the week before everyone went into quarantine. And a couple of months before that, I'd been chatting with my friend and a fellow graduate student at the University of Hawaii, Lillian Burkhardt, who's my second author on this work. Lillian works in the group of Bridget Smith Conter, and she looks at tectonic models for icy satellites, that's stress and strain on Ganymede, Titan, Europa. And Lillian told me, Emily, you know, way back when in my undergrad for Bridget, I was doing these maps in support of these tectonic models. And I drew a bunch of circles around craters on high resolution images on Ganymede. Could that be useful in any way? My jaw hit the floor. I said, oh my gosh, yes, let me see them. How exciting. When I finished my dissertation, I finally started looking at these maps and looking at Lillian's crater counts. And they were incomplete, but I was able to spend the first two months of quarantine huddled up in my little bed with ArcGIS open and drawing craters, looking at this beautiful body. So I'm gonna be sharing the results of that quarantine project and Lillian and my crater counts and the analysis that we did with the help of Marissa Cameron uh, to explore how these uh, new crater counts can help us to understand the relative ages of individual terrains on Ganymede. So as you can see from this globe of Ganymede, Ganymede is a really spectacular moon. It's uh, one of the four Galilean satellites with Io, Europa, and Callisto. And as you can see, based on just the albedo differences on its surface, it's got some really interesting and fascinating geology, especially for someone coming from uh, looking at the moon a lot, which is what I did for my undergrad, or for my graduate studies. So the map that we're looking at is from Cameron et al. 2018. Uh, Marissa Cameron made this map with her co-authors, co uh, an ArcGIS package, that showed Ganymede imagery using Galileo solid state images that were stitched into this global map. You can see the terrains that we counted craters on in little blue squares all across this map. And we also, I've plotted all of the uh, large craters that Lillian and I counted and the global scale across the map here too. So as you can see, even from this image, maybe even more beautifully, are these sinuous light terrain features cross-cutting across this dark terrain. And it's pretty well understood based on previous crater counts that the dark terrain is old. It's really heavily cratered. While the light terrain are these fascinating extensional tectonic features, which show ridges and trough terrains, and sometimes even uh, uh, other tectonic features that are really fascinating and are younger than the dark terrain. They're significantly less cratered. And we see that too in our crater counts. You can see that our crater count areas cover a pretty wide range of different areas on Ganymede. We've got leading and trailing count areas, which is important because Ganymede has a pretty significant leading trailing asymmetry. So in the next uh, few slides, I'm gonna be zooming into each of these and then showing you our crater count statistics. It's a pretty straightforward geologic analysis of what our craters did. I won't go into too much detail about the implications of all of this, but that's sort of what I'm hoping that we can discuss together after the talk. I'm really excited to think about how this work can uh, be included in future studies of the cratering rate in the outer solar system. So here we have this global look again of all of the craters that we counted. I've binned the data and we're looking at a cumulative size frequency distribution of all of the craters that we counted. Uh, our counts are in black here. You can see at about 10 kilometers, yeah, 10 kilometers, you are seeing a little bit of scatter in the distribution. That's because that's where the resolution of our relatively small count areas is meeting the resolution or the size frequency distributions that we're getting from that global population that we put together. So I've also plotted blue stars, which were taken from the table in Shankaral 2004, the book Jupiter. Um, and we can see that our counts pretty align quite well with these counts. I've also plotted red squares, which represent the 
crater population predicted by the Zanle et al. 2003 uh, cratering rates in the outer solar system for Ganymede. And even just from looking at this general distribution, we agree at larger sizes, so things above 10 kilometers, we're agreeing quite well. But once we get smaller, we see a little bit more craters at one kilometer, for example, than were predicted by the Zanli et al. 2003 model. You can also see that there's evidence of the different ages of terrains or, or features um, in this plot. You can see that Gilgamesh ejecta, this was from uh, the Schenk et al. 2004, this is a relatively young impact basin on Ganymede, interpreted to be about a billion years old. And it's offset from the general global population, meaning that this is a relatively young feature. I've also plotted two little pink stars for crater populations on Europa, just to illustrate how young Europa really is compared to its neighbors based on its crater distributions. But it looks like a similar population, the shape is the same, so that's interesting and uh, valuable. All right, so let's dive into some of these individual terrains. I've sort of grouped them where we're going to be looking based on where in, on, the, on the moon we're looking. So first, let's start with our trailing anti-Jovian terrains. Oh gosh, these images were such a delight to look at. I just feel really lucky to have been able to do this. So here we see one of these sulci, which we see in really interesting ridge and trough formations. Fascinating crater right on the, on the middle of it. This is Byblis sulcus. Now here we've got Tiamat sulcus where we see intersecting white terrains on a background of dark terrains. Finally, we've got a transitional terrain where we see a significant portion of our count area was this dark terrain. And now Anchar Sulcus, again, a significant portion of this count is this dark terrain in the background where you see really heavily cratered background. So here we see our, uh, our crater statistics. I plotted the cumulative number as uh, per kilometer squared following the Crater Analysis Working Group 1979 rules for presenting this kind of data. And we can see these interesting relationships between these, uh, these features. And really what I wanted to illustrate with this is that the frames that are more taken up by light terrains look relatively young compared to the frames that are more taken up by the dark terrains. Now in future studies, if we wanted to look at the absolute ages of these sulci or sulcus, um, then we could mask out the dark terrains to just count the craters, to just include the craters on these light terrains in our counts. Um, but for now, it's just a presentation of this crater data. And we can really see that there's a significant offset where we can see the older age of these relatively dark terrains versus the lighter ones. Now let's go up to Nipur and Phyllis Sulcus. This is one of my favorite terrains to look at because we got a really great distribution of different interesting things. So you can see I broke our count area into four different sections. We've got A up in the north. Or if you can see, there's some uh, lines that make it look like this sulcus is oriented in, in, a, in a sort of horizontal direction. Then we've got B, which is oriented in a catty corner direction. C, which is op opposite catty corner, and finally a D region, which is that dark, heavily cratered terrain. Now, when I plot my crater counts, we can really clearly see that that D terrain is the oldest. It's the furthest up in my distribution. The second oldest is this uh, C terrain, and the third is A, and the youngest is this B terrain, and that actually fits the tectonic history that was interpreted by Cameron et al. in 2018 for this same region. They looked at cross-cutting relationships and uh, were able to come to the same conclusion. But I feel like what we can bring to the table with the craters is maybe in the future using these to constrain the absolute age of these different uh, tectonic events. Now let's move on to our Bela Sulcus. This is another of my favorite regions just because it had so much geologic complexity. 
here we've got how I've split the count regions of Arbella sulcus into uh, different sections where um, I've got the whole count area, just this big patch. I then also selected a smaller region within this really heavily cratered terrain to the left called, that I've called F. I also have, uh, in, this, in this region, there were some really high resolution strip of images that covered Arbella sulcus at, sulci itself and some of this uh, really interesting ridged terrain to its left and some of the older looking terrain to its right. So I was able to complete really uh, great crater counts on this region. We got down to 100 meter craters, really interesting. So here I've plotted all of them together. We see F is that dark navy at the top. Obviously it's the oldest terrain. It looks like it, you could visually confirm that. But now we have a quantitative way to confirm it too. The second oldest that was the uh, terrain to the right of Arbella sulcus, this I terrain, which looks almost as old as terrain S, but you can see that it's a little bit offset, it's slightly younger, which is uh, interesting. Then we see uh, terrain H is the, uh, the second youngest, and terrain four is the very youngest, which is a little bit perplexing because up in the, if you look just above the H in the Arbella sulcus, I can't have a little pointer on my screen right now, but um, if you look just above it, you'll see that there's a cross-cutting relationship between these two features where the sulci, the bright ridge terrain on H is cross-cutting that really ridged groove terrain in G. So I suspect that we're seeing some funny business with the terrain texture or removing some of our crater counts from this area. So now let's go on to non sulci. This is another interesting one where it's predominantly taken up by sulcus, these uh, light terrains. And you can see I've, I've also included a transitional terrain just to show that really obvious age offset in the crater size frequency distributions. Now finally, let's get on to the leading hemisphere, which is really interesting. So we've got Dardanus sulcus. This is a really fascinating region. It's not as high resolution as some of the ones that I've been previously presenting. You can see the scale bar is about a thousand kilometers. But really fascinating geologic history happening here. Now this is Uruk sulcus, which is a tiny little patch on the leading hemisphere that we were able to look at. If you see the scale bar now, we're at 160 kilometers. So we're getting a really interesting different mix of perspectives here. And finally, I just selected a random swath of the Galileo Regio dark terrain on the leading hemisphere. This is a really well studied region. Louise Proctor published a, a paper about crater counts in the dark terrains in 1998. Um, so I'm not really contributing anything special here or new, but I wanted to have a crater population in my data set that represented the heavily cratered leading hemisphere dark terrain that I would have full control of and I could do whatever I wanted to it with my statistics. So here I've plotted them all together. You can see Oryx sulcus, as we might expect as a, a light terrain, is younger. Dardanus sulcus is similarly younger, but again, remember I didn't uh, mask out the uh, light terrains on Dardanus sulcus. So we might see an even younger age for the individual light terrains once I do mask those out. You can see the dark terrain, and I've also included that really heavily cratered terrain from Arbella as a navy blue in here. And we can see that they're, they're definitely older. Now some other interesting things that we were able to see is that in the youngest terrains, I think we're seeing secondaries. So for craters of diameter between 100 meters and one kilometer, they follow a really steep power loss slope. It's about negative four. And uh, when I plot them with the Beerhaus et al. 2001 crater counts from Europa, it's pretty startling how excellent the fit is. So I've scaled the Bo Beerhaus uh, Europa secondary crater counts here in these pink stars. Um, I've scaled them to the impact probability at Ganymede. But even when I don't do that, it's uh, still startlingly similar to those Arbella sulcus H crater counts. So fascinating there. Another thing I want to point out is look at that star Gilgamesh. 
So I've got a little uh, error bar there to account for some uncertainty in the leading trailing asymmetry. Um, but you can see that a lot of these sulci are correlated in age with the Gilgamesh impact basin. Curious. Another interesting thing that we saw was that I think that the dark terrains are in equilibrium for craters of 100 kilometers and smaller. So when I plot the uh, uh, crater equilibrium occurs when craters of a similar size uh, remove or craters are degraded of that same size as quickly as they're forming on the surface, which means that if we're taking these crater counts on the dark terrains and using them as a data point in our assessments of the cratering rate or the ancient cratering rate, we're getting a lower number than we really should be because these craters are erasing as quickly as they're forming. Another really interesting thing is when I uh, calculated the predicted number of craters for these ancient terrains from the Zanli et al. 2003 model, I'm getting about an order of magnitude too few craters, even for the surface not in equilibrium. If the surface is in equilibrium, then there were even more craters in the ancient past than uh, we'd be able to predict. So finally, my conclusions first is that Using our crater size frequency distributions, we can absolutely tell the relative age of individual features on Ganymede, which is pretty exciting. I also think that the dark terrain is probably in equilibrium for craters less than 100 kilometers in diameter, which has implications for the ancient impact rate, which is something that I hope you all think about me in the future as we continue to think about impact rates in the outer solar system. So in the future, Lillian and I are working on con constraining the crater degradation rate on an IC satellite which will have implications for equilibrium and ties back into my dissertation work in impact gardening. Lillian is also going to do for her uh, third chapter of her PhD thesis is explore this idea of a giant impact uh, causing slip on faults on an icy satellite. So could Gilgamesh Basin, like its namesake, have slain the bull of heaven and triggered tectonic activity on Ganymede one last time? So look forward to more on that from Lillian in the future. And I'll be thrilled to take any questions from you now. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, great talk. Very interesting stuff. Um, so it looks like Paul has been typing into, um, <laughs> typing into, Paul Shank has been typing into the chat. So I'll let Stuart take over. Yeah, I think it might be just easier if I unmute Paul and then he can go ahead and uh, converse. Yeah, great course clicking there we go Paul be careful what you wish for ah, well I've got my little notes this is exactly what I wanted so okay I'll, I have more comments than anything else um, uh, I was intrigued by the the relative density of the craters in the Arabella sulcus G mm. and H trains mm. uh, where you see less let me see if I can get this right. Less craters on the slightly older train. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah that's whatever right. that was. That's right. And, and and that it's you mentioned the, the the fabric of the train. I think that's important because right. such a densely for a fragmented train could distort the impact on creation, but also make them difficult to recognize. So it'd be exactly. useful to know if you if you can find a way to actually demonstrate that with some mm, okay. some other alternative way of um, showing that maybe those craters are in fact there and, and they're just very difficult to recognize. I don't know what they would be, but anyway. Yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, worth pursuing in some. Yeah, some maybe point. we could uh, um, plumb the minds of the lunar scientists who have looked at really interesting and strange terrains on the moon and talk to them about how they constrain their crater counts and how that affects them. Yeah, and then the, the last comment was that, um, you know, Gilgamesh clearly is superposed on all the bright train in its area, mm. which is south. Uh, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen rather quickly after bright train. It, it's, not a, it's not a very fresh crater uh, basin, uh, so it could have happened late, very late in the bright terrain sequence uh, mm. period, which was protracted. Right. Which is what Lillian and I are going to try and explore with this idea of could yeah. a large impact base in the seismic moment from that have triggered fault slip yeah. as a test of concept for that. Yeah. 
Okay, Paul, if you're done, uh, there's a question from Kelsey Singer. Uh, thanks for the talk. One question about your age estimates from Zonley et al. 2003. Did you include a factor for decay of the population of impactors over time? I or, did. Okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, the rest of her question and statement does not apply. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so even with that factor of forward decay, uh, it's still an order of magnitude too little to explain what we see, let alone if it's in equilibrium. So time to think about cratering rates again. Oh yeah, definitely. And I know there are people looking at cratering rates um, and cratering populations. Kelsey is one of them using mm -hmm. the Pluto data. And so, um, and uh, there are many others out there and it's a complex problem and any, every and any data set helps. So this is awesome. Yeah. So people um, who are going to think about it, think of me. I want to help collaborate. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would recommend too, if you could find a way to um, get these distributions the, uh, or your data set online somehow on either on a PDS or, or your own website or whatever. Yeah, I'll publish them publicly. I've got the paper into JGR now. We're waiting for reviews, but I plan to have it publicly available. Great, great. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, the saturation doesn't surprise me. I've, I've also studied saturation quite a bit. And uh, Ganymede dark terrain is, is one of a very saturated place. So, mm -hmm. and Clark, done, Clark Chapman has done a lot of work on what that means for populations as well. And, um, but there's still more to be done and understood about that. So, yeah. Okay, um, any other questions or comments for Emily?